Uh, if you're a guest or haven't been with us for the last few weeks, we started a series several weeks ago called Attitude Check. And really the design of the series, you know, Paul says this really difficult thing in the book of Philippians where he says do everything without complaining and arguing, which we kind of took a poll and said uh, the result was that's hard. And, and, and so what we've been exploring in this series is God's invitation to live our lives with a certain type of attitude uh, irrespective of our circumstances. And that might sound really idealistic, but it seems to be the, the invitation of Jesus, that no matter what's going on around you, there's this attitude with which you can live life. And so what we've spent the last several weeks or the last couple of weeks is just exploring, okay, how do we do that? Because oftentimes what we do in spiritual circles is we just say, like, do it, dummy. Like, the, you know, it's that, like, just do it. And that's kind of the extent of our spiritual direction is, well, do it. Jesus says to do it, do it, and, or grunt, and it'll happen. And what we've been exploring is this idea of, okay, are there, are there ways behind the scenes that we can work on that? In fact, the, the picture that we've been using is, what if we thought of our attitude like a muscle? You know, like a muscle can be in shape or out of shape. Notice that happening? Um, it, it can be healthy or it can be unhealthy. And the way that you make a muscle healthy is you exercise it. There's things that you do uh, in oftentimes kind of artificial settings where you build and add strength to that muscle. And so we've said, what if, what if that's the way you work on your attitude? What if it's not a wand? What if it's not like just do it because Jesus said to? What, what if there's these things you do behind the scenes and that translates to the fruitfulness of a good attitude in the rest of your life, marriage, home, all that stuff? So really the series has been about for those, it's been for those of you who go like, yeah, this is tough stuff. And for the rest of you, we'll see you in December. Uh, so, so we've talked about two exercises so far. We, 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 we've talked about this idea of feeding our minds. And really the idea there has been that uh, our minds have a metabolism, that they have to consume things. And thus we can feed it healthy stuff or we can feed it unhealthy stuff. And we tried to not take a legalistic stance, but just to go like, if you'd feed your mind the way you know you're supposed to 80% of the time, then you'd be golden, uh, which isn't a permission for the other 20%, but you're with me, right? And then last week we talked about our words. Uh, that words matter, that words don't just reflect our hearts, but they form reality, uh, and, and that and therefore the, the old statement, like sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me, we just came to the conclusion that that's bogus, that, that James a couple thousand years ago said, like, no, words are like a rudder. They, they, they matter, they steer lives. This week we're going to talk about a third exercise, and then next week, just kind of look ahead this week and then next week. Next week we're going to talk about criticism kind of along the lines of, okay, so how do we criticize then? Because there's a place within Christ for criticism, so we're going to get really, really practical next week and go like, okay, so when it's appropriate to criticize, how do we go about that in a way that reflects Jesus? This week, one more exercise. And speaking of exercise, we've got a video. Well, can you guess what our third tool is? <laughs> Good morning, everyone. I'm Lindsay, and... Um, I get to talk to you this morning about the third exercise for our Attitude Check series, and that is exercise. <laughs> um, I'm really excited to be here. And for those of you that, I, I know a lot of you, but I'm actually looking around, I know a lot of people in here, but for those of you that don't know me, um, my husband and I moved here as part of the launch team that came from Billings to help start Narrate. So it's especially um, exciting for me to be here with you today. So I know when we talk about exercise, it's kind of why I wanted the cheesy workout videos to break the ice because sometimes you can talk about it and all of these other conversations come up, right? Like, you know, you Google the word exercise or even health on the internet or try to find a book. I mean, there's just so many conversations that go on. And what I want to talk to you about today, though, is just the conversation of exercise and attitude. So all those conversations about heart disease, cholesterol, you're getting overweight, all of those conversations, we're just going to set them aside, okay? We're just going to put them aside right there. They're good conversations, they're valid, um, but that's not what I want to talk to you about today. So hopefully that can help us relax a little bit. I'm not going to tell you that you... Um, you know, I'm not going to beat it into you. But I do want to just bring another perspective to mind. So when I started studying and kind of learning and about this talk and preparing for it, I was thinking about it's really all of my worlds colliding. Because what I get to do during the day is I work for the state health department. And I get to look, work in public health. And I get to look at what is the state of the public's health? What in Montana, how are we doing? What, where are we really healthy? Where are we not very healthy? So I get to look at the big group, the population's health. And then on, the, on another hand, my other job that I get to do is I teach group fitness at Crossroads, which I know a lot of you from that. So <laughs> um, hi. But so that's the other job I get to do. And I get to look at individuals' health. 
And that I think I would do full time if I could, but I, it's just not um, in the cards for me right now. But I love it because as a fitness instructor, what I get to do is help people become fit, but not just that, but see all of these other benefits of exercise. And that's kind of one of the main reasons I was excited to be here today. So uh, when I was preparing for this, I started thinking about, you know, what, are, what am I going to talk about? How am I going to frame this? And I realized that one of my very first memories is of exercising. And um, <clears throat> very familiar with some of those videos that we saw because my mom, did anyone do jazzercise in here? Anyone? Yep, that's right. Be proud of it, okay? <laughs> my mom did jazzercise when I was growing up. And one of my very first memories is of her going to the Knights of Columbus in Billings, Montana. And we'd go, and I was like four or five, you know, and we'd go in and her and the ladies would all dance around and do jazzercise on the concrete floor, you know, high impact aerobics that we know we're not supposed to do on that. And across from there was the smoky bar at the Knights of Columbus, which also bugs me because I'm in public health. But anyway, um, and so they would do jazzercise and I was just this four or five year old dancing around in the back row and it just stuck with me and I developed this real love for group fitness. And it's kind of funny because along with the jazzercise thing, they would wear those full body leotards, you know? Yeah, I have one. I wore it for Halloween last year. Um, but I had to wear like stuff over it because those things are not forgiving. I don't care how in shape you are. I don't know. Like, mm. but, um, but now, and I used to make fun of her because they would go to Rimrock Mall in Billings and they'd like do a jazzercise routine to get people to join. And we'd make fun of her so bad. But now you guys, I teach Zumba and I don't know if you've seen those pants or those clothes and they're not much better. And so I, I can't really make fun of her anymore. But Anyway, so I really, I grew up with exercise in that regard. Um, I just always really enjoyed doing videos and I would be in my basement. I was the only kid at home and we had this big basement and my mom had like every exercise video from the 80s you could imagine, like Buns of Steel, Tony Little, all of them, I did them. <laughs> so, so I would be in the basement doing these little exercise videos and it just, I enjoyed it. But I wasn't really an athlete. I did swimming and I played soccer till about eighth grade. And um, then in eighth grade, I just kind of was like, eh, I'm over this. I don't want to do it anymore, but I'll keep doing my videotapes. <laughs> and so then when I hit my junior year, I don't know why, but I just, something in me wanted to take this class at school called sports conditioning. And I don't know if they still do this. I kind of um, at schools now if they have the class that like all the athletes take to stay in shape during the year and um, it was kind of intimidating you know they kept saying yeah they make you run till you throw up on the first day because they don't want any of the wussy kids getting in they want to weed them all out and so I was a little nervous that first day because <laughs> like I said I wasn't an athlete but Anyway, I went to it and I enjoyed it. Well, I didn't enjoy the first day. They did run us a lot, which now looking back was probably like 15 minutes, right? But at the time you're like, I'm dying <laughs> and <laughs> if I can do it and I didn't quit. So I went there the first day and I, I stuck out the class and I look back now, especially as I was thinking about today, that that was really kind of a turning point in my life, kind of a place where I really figured out, gosh, I really enjoy exercise and activity and this is something really important to me. And it was something I just decided to stick with. <clears throat> Excuse me. And at that point in my life, my mom was struggling with mental illness. And um, I'd watched, you, you know, I just knew something connected in me where I knew that when I was active and when I did this kind of, you know, when, when I was exercising, I felt better. Not, it wasn't, it had nothing to do with weight or body. It was, I felt better mentally. And so I made that connection at that time. And it just really stuck with me, even through um, everything else. Let me grab a quick drink of water here. All right. So no one would argue with us that exercising is good for you, right? Like no one's sitting there going, I would exercise. I mean, I have all this extra time and I would use it to exercise, but it's just so bad for me. I'm just not gonna, right? That's not what you're saying to yourselves. No one comes in here. I mean, I run into people all the time at the store with my work with Crossroads. And sometimes I I think they avoid me a lot of times because they're like, oh, I haven't been to the gym in three weeks. She's going to say something and they're dodging me, <laughs> you know, because everyone feels bad if they're not exercising, right? So that's, but what people rarely talk about, and it's usually always in relation to those conversations that we're not going to have today. It's rarely in relation to, gosh, it's the way it affects me. It's the way my mental health and my attitude and the way I feel. It's very rarely that's not the conversation that we hear. And so that's the conversation I want to have today. And that's the connection I want to say. What's the, what role does exercise play in, in helping our attitude? 
All right, so that's where we're going to go. But to start us off, first of all, we have to have a little neuroscience um, lesson, okay? Sound good? All right, so um, <laughs> one of the basic structures of the brain is, oh, wait, I know what I was going to say. Back up with me for a second. So no matter where you're at with the exercise on the exercise continuum, if you're like over here and you work out all the time and you love it and it's a huge part of your life or you're over here and you just have, um, you know, you don't, you don't exercise, you'd rather play video games, it's, it's okay. Wherever you're at on that continuum, I think we're going to bring a new perspective to it today. So stick with me, all right? So, all right, that's all I wanted to say. Now on to our neuro, neuroscience lesson. So my footnote for what I'm going to talk to you about right now is that I read some, um, a number of peer-reviewed journal articles for what I'm about to share, but then I also have one of my good friends who has a PhD in neuroscience, and I ran it all by her and got some stuff validated through her. So I can give you more information on that after service if you're interested, but that's just kind of my, my footnote to put at the bottom of the report for what I'm about to share with you, okay? Um, so when you think about our brain, the basic structure of your brain is your brain cells. And what those are called <laughs> are neurons. And I brought a picture. So this is a basic neuron. And what a neuron does in our brain is they just send signals all the time. See those little avenues? They're always just sending signals, whether it's I'm hungry, I need to eat, your eyelids dry, I need to blink, all, all, all of those, all of the reactions in our body. Our brain is transmitting those signals. And in the brain, those neurons, much like our attitude, they're not a muscle, but kind of like what Adam's been talking in these last couple of weeks about attitude, they can be healthy or not as well, depending on how much activity, how they're stimulated, how well they're used. And um, what they're seeing in relation to exercise is that people that exercise, their brain, their neurons are healthier. They're just healthier. They're more active. The way my friend Amber put it, she goes, yeah, you can look at them and they just look sad. Okay, so they just look sad, you guys, if you don't exercise. <laughs> um, but so that's one thing that research is showing us is that the brain cells are more healthy. They're more robust and more active. Now, the other thing we want to talk about is an area of the brain called the hippocampus, which I also brought a picture to show you. So last week we talked about the frontal lobe. This week we're talking about the hippocampus. Now, that's the um, area of your brain that's associated with memory and learning. All right, so stick with me. We have neurons that are transmitter, transmitting signals. We have the hippocampus, and that's associated with memory and learning. <clears throat> and now we have what is, it, what is exercise doing in these areas of the brain? How does it impact these areas? So it makes our brain cells healthier and more robust, but then what it also does is it gives birth to new brain cells. They're seeing, especially in older adults, this is a big deal. They're seeing when they exercise that they're rebirthing new brain cells, new neurons. That's the first one that's important. The second one that's important is a term in neuroscience that goes like this. Cells that fire together, wire together. Say it with me. Cells that fire together, wire together. Okay, <clears throat> so what that means is, you know when you're studying for a test or trying to memorize a talk that you're giving at church or something like that, and um, you're saying it over and over and over, and then all of a sudden it sticks. That's what it is. It's those transmitters that, that were up there, that fire, 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 and it's made. Cells that fire together, wire together. So in the hippocampus specifically, what they're finding with exercise is that when you exercise, those connections that are made are stronger, hardier, and they last longer. So think of it like some really cheap Velcro that falls apart and some really good, strong Velcro that is water resistant. So it, those connections are really, they're much stronger in people that are exercising. So we have, so let's kind of pack this all together. So we have healthier neurons, healthier brain cells, specifically in the hippocampus, in the area of your brain that's associated with learning and memory. Amber even said one of the things that they're seeing is that the hippocampus can grow because of the new brain cells that are generated. Neuro neurogenesis is what it's called. Um, because of that, that area of your brain can grow and can be more and more active in that regard. And then we have um, the connections that they make are stronger and healthier and more robust. Okay, so I'm going to group all that for this morning and call that cognitive function. Our cognitive function is increased with exercise. So when we stimulate our bodies, when we move, when we, our, our brain is activated, and these are the things that take place that physiologically help our brain function better when we exercise. So we have this much brain activity, it's increasing, okay? 
Now, when I say exercise, I feel like I need to define this too, specifically. So you're sitting there this morning, and your resting heart rate, just sitting there, kind of hanging out, listening to me, is anywhere between you know, 65 to 75, depending on your health and your genetic makeup and all those kinds of things. So when I talk about exercise, what I mean is getting your heart rate up to 120 beats per minute at a minimum, this is your minimum, for 30 minutes a day, or for 30 minutes, so hold it at the 120 beats per minute for 30 minutes or more, four days a week. That's the threshold that um, these studies are seeing that there's chemical, there, there's differences in the brain when we do that. So when I talk about exercise today, that's what, I, that's what I'm meaning, all right? You don't have to do a Tony Little video, but you can do it. Ha, ha, the gazelle, no? Okay. <laughs> um, so then the next thing in the brain, the next physiological thing I want to talk about. So we're cognitive functions over here. We're seeing we have an increased capacity for learning and for memory in our brain is stimulated by exercise. Increased cognitive function. Okay, now we're going to come over here and we're going to talk about hormones. Because the brain also stimulates, it excites your endocrine system to produce it, or it, with hormone production. So there's two hormones that it produces and one that it decreases production of when we exercise. The first one that it produces is one that you guys probably are all familiar with, and that is uh, endorphins. We've all heard of the runner's high, or yeah, it's the feel-good hormone, and it makes you feel really good, and um, that's in, that, those are endorphins. And what we see is that those are not just produced right when you're exercising, but they stay in your system, and they stay in your body for hours after, and have huge benefits in that regard. Okay, the second one, that, the second hormone that's produced in your body when we exercise is one called catecholamine. And that hormone is associated with the fight or flight kind of response, that confidence, you know, whatever's thrown at you during the day, whether you're going to melt down or whether you can take it. So I'm not a parent, but I imagine, because parenting scares me, but I imagine that if I was, it's that thing, it's that hormone in you that you have a circumstance and it's, you come home and your kids have just destroyed your house and it's do you melt down or do you, you know, pick it up and get them going and take care of business? <laughs> I don't know. But that's the hormone that helps regulate those functions in your body. Okay, so increased production of endorphins, feel-good hormones, Increased production of catecholamine, the hormone that helps our bodies regulate that confidence, that fight or flight uh, reaction, and then a decreased production of cortisol, which is associated with fear. That's the hormone that makes you feel anxious. It, you know, kind of it's a, it's that stress-inducing kind of fear-producing hormone. So we have a decrease in cortisol. All right, so we have our. Cognitive function is increased as a result of exercise. This is a lot of information, but it's good. So then over here, we have these three hormones that are working together to regulate your body, to regulate your systems, to set you up for emotional resiliency. All right, that's what I want to just kind of give that, that term today. So all of those hormones come together, set you up, you're more emotionally resilient. So we had this much brain activity, brain capacity over here. We increased it to here with the exercising on the cognitive function. Now we have over here emotional resiliency that was here. Now we're increasing it by just through regulating our hormones through the production and um, lack of production of certain hormones in our body. So we keep increasing our capacity. All right, so what's the point? What does this have to do with what we're talking about, with attitude check? The point is when you increase your cognitive function, the impact of exercise on increasing your cognitive function and your emotional resiliency, it increases your capacity to live life. It increases your ability to be who you were made to be, right? And who doesn't want that? That's what God wants for us too. He wants you to be the best you that you can be because no one else can be you, right? No one else can bring to the table what you bring to the table. Your creativity, your ideas, your thoughts, if those are you know, app operating at full capacity, you can do amazing things emotionally, being resilient, what, what you can do with that, all right? I need to grab another drink of water. So let's talk about a typical work day. Just your typical, we'll call it an, a typical American work day because I don't want to point any fingers. <laughs> but I always picture, you know that five-hour energy commercial? That guy wakes up and he's like half awake and then five-hour energy saves his life and he's like functioning highly the rest of the day. That one. So 
I, I picture that that's how a lot of us wake up in the morning, you know, that's how a lot of typical American days, work days start. So they start like that, and then you kind of wake up around 10 a.m., right? Like kind of, okay, I'm, I'm with it. I have a couple hours of good work, good productivity to do. Um, and then about noon, you have lunch, and then 3 o'clock comes, and you have the 3 o'clock crash, and you feel yourself tanking for the afternoon, and then you kind of watch the clock until 5 or whatever it is. 5 o'clock, you go home, you're spent for the day, you are done, and you recover that night, get up, do it again tomorrow morning, right? I mean, does that sound kind of basically, maybe exaggerating in some areas, but that's what I picture the typical American workday as. So hold on to that thought, and I want to look at the Proverbs a little bit. So there's not a whole lot of Bible this week for what we're, what we're talking about, but if it's a conversation that you'd like to continue to have with, um, with God and in your quiet times, <clears throat> excuse me, to think about, what I would suggest is doing a word study just in the book of Proverbs on idleness, laziness, and the sluggard. And that's kind of what I looked at when I was thinking about this. And just, <clears throat> it's different because there isn't a verse in the Bible that says, exercise, you know, thou shall get a workout in six days a week. <laughs> There's nothing like that, right? But if you think about it, in their time, that wasn't, we were made, we were made to be working already. In that time, they walked everywhere. You know, physical labor was a part of life. And, um, but, but let's just see a couple of little notes, some, some thoughts from the Proverbs. So the first one I want to talk about is Proverbs 12, 27. And these are from the message version, just as a FYI. It says, a lazy life is an empty life. And now think about that capacity that we were just talking about here with the cognitive function and the emotional resilience and, and what you give yourself to and, and all the you that you bring to the table every day. So a lazy life is an empty life. All right, the next one. Proverbs 10.26, a lazy employee will give you nothing but trouble. Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> we didn't have to probably be told that, but it's there. And then the last one is Proverbs 13.4, a sluggard craves and gets nothing, but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. So think about that typical work day that I just talked about and take it into context, thinking about some of those things about an empty life, a lazy employee is nothing but trouble, a sluggard, he desires, but he doesn't, he doesn't get anything. He just wants it, but he doesn't go after it. He doesn't do anything to get it. So what if we were living life from a deeper capacity? What if we brought to the table, whether with our jobs, with our relationships, just a little bit more, right? A little bit more of our, our brain and a little bit more of our emotion. What would that look like? I'd like, to, I'd like to think if we revisited that typical day from a deeper capacity perspective that you'd have, um, you'd wake up probably a little more refreshed because when you're working and you're moving your body and you're using it for what it's made for, you have better sleep. That's also something that's been proven. So you'd wake up a little more refreshed, maybe still need some coffee because coffee's good, right? I don't, I don't want to give up my coffee. Um, and then, but probably not as much or else you get jittery. And then you go to lunch, have lunch, but three o'clock comes and, and guess what? You don't crash because you're not at capacity. You have way more still left over here. So you can read that article at work that you need to read and you can understand the first paragraph instead of having to read it four times before you finally comprehend it, right? We've all been there. And then, and then you have some emotional resilience left too because when you get home at five and, and your kids need you or you have to go volunteer at this, um, you know, you mentor, maybe you're a big brother, a big sister, you still have some emotion left over. You still have something to give to those relationships too. So you're living out of a deeper capacity. You're deepening that well that you're drawing from. And it's real fact. It's, it's scientific, the impact of exercise on our life physiologically, but then how that carries over to the rest of what we do is pretty incredible. So I travel for work. Not a lot, but enough. And um, <laughs> one of the things that I've noticed is that when I travel, it always involves sitting for a long periods of time. Steve's like, you travel, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you get <ain't> nothing. <laughs> no, but, but once in a while I do. Um, but I have to sit a, for long periods of time. It involves a lot of information overload and it involves food, right? Because everyone wants to go out for dinner and, or breakfast and then there's always like, you know, you have to have, for some reason, they think we have to have bagels and danishes and muffins at like 10.30 and 3.30, and I don't think we do, but they're always there. Anyway, so um, what I've learned is when I travel, it's essential that I work out or else I see it because 
the teaching, fit, teaching here at Crossroads in town, it's great because it's always in my schedule. Like, there's no way I can miss it or else I have to have someone lined up to teach it. It's what I've built into my life to keep me accountable to exercising. And I always tell my classes, you guys are way better than I am because I get paid to be here. You're here by choice. Like, you're making this a part of your life way more than I am. And so good job. Um, but when I travel, I really notice that if I'm not physically active, I'm crashing by the middle of the day. That 3 o'clock, I get it. It's, I'm done. And I can't keep my eyes open, and I'm trying to pay attention, and my work is paying for me to be there to get this information. So I want, I want it. I want to be a good employee. I want to be able to bring all of my creativity and my mind and what I've learned to the table. But if, I'm, if I don't exercise, I crash. And so sometimes, um, well, actually, this was one incident in Haver. I had to go to Haver. I know you're jealous. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> no, Haver is, is great. It's great. Um, the worst is when I have to go to Sydney because I can't stay there because there's no hotels. That's the hard one, so I have to drive back to Billings. Anyway, so I went to Haver, and their you know, exercise room there was like a 1980s treadmill and an ab machine that doesn't really actually work. And then a mat that had, I don't want to touch it, you know, whatever. And so I went to the front desk and I was like, do you guys have a conference room that I could just like lock myself in for an hour and just exercise? <laughs> and they're like, okay. <laughs> they kind of look at me like I'm crazy, but my friends that know me that are laughing right now, they know I just put my iPod in and I just do a class right there by myself. <laughs> but it's what I have to do. It's what I love. It's, I'm not a runner. And I think that's something that's been big and important for me to learn, is that there are people out there that run and that love it. And God bless them, because I don't, all right? But I'm still physically fit, and I'm still really active. And in fact, um, someone said to me after the first service, they were like, I know why I don't exercise. It's because it is boring to run. I hate that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, then don't do it. Find something that you love. But that's, it's just essential. It's essential to... Um, what you bring to the table to deepen that capacity to live life out of fully you. I think exercise is, it's shown to really increase that. So um, I have some ideas to help you guys get started. All right. So the first one I want to share with you, because I know now all of you are thinking, yeah, I'm in, I'm in. So to get you started, uh, the first one I want to tell you is figure out what works for you. Kind of already said that a little bit, but if you're not a runner, don't run. Don't think that that's what it, you know, find out what works for you. I have to always say to, you know, check with a doctor if you're in a place where you might need to get some uh, boundaries put on that, some parameters, and you, you need to check with your doctor first. But then also, are you a morning person or not? Or do, you, do you work better in the evening? Do, are you social? Are you introvert? You know, I have lots of friends. I have a friend who, he takes a Bible verse and he runs and he meditates on that. And so for him, that's his time with the Lord and his physical activity. And it's just been a great way that he's managed that in his life and built that into his life. And he loves it. Again, not me. I wouldn't do it. <laughs> but um, so figure out what works for you and, and figure out if you do you need people around you or do you need to be by yourself. Figure it out. Second thing is schedule it into your life. Like I said earlier, if it's not scheduled on my Outlook calendar, right, or on my iPhone, does it happen? No, I forget it. Schedule it into your life. If you tell people, I can't, I gotta be somewhere, that's okay. You can say no to you know, going out after work or say, I always meet up with people at seven. You know, it's very, very common for me to say, okay, how about seven o'clock? Because I know I have something before that. And so scheduling it into your life, making it a priority, you'll see a huge difference in, in just the outcomes. Third, do what you enjoy. Don't force yourself to do something that you hate. Maybe, you know, I always say, this is why Zumba has gotten so big. It's one of the classes that I get to teach at Crossroads. It's because it's fun. You don't have to make yourself go. You feel bummed if you miss it. You know, now some people, they don't think it's that fun, but, but some people love it. I mean, we have people get there like 20 minutes early to get their spot, you know? So it's a big deal, but it's because they enjoy it. They want to be there. They don't think to themselves, oh, I got to work out. It's, I get to go work out. I get to go be active. And, and that's what you really want to find. What is that in your life? What is that going to be for you? And then the last thing is I want you guys to start by focusing on your attitude. So we talked about there's all those conversations around physical fitness and around exercise that um, we didn't really touch on today for a reason. And 
I really want to encourage you guys to start exercising. If you say, yeah, I do. I need to make this a part of my life. It's something that I want. I want, you know, to do this. Focus on how it's going to impact your attitude. Don't think about weight loss. Don't think about anything else. Just think about your attitude and your mental health. Have that be your focus. Because one of the things uh, working at the gym, I've been teaching group fitness now for 10 years. And um, one of the things I taught at some gyms in Billings, and I've only been at Crossroads since I've been here in Helena, but that I've noticed is when people come and they're like, I want to lose 40 pounds for my wedding next month. And it's never anything realistic. But it's also never anything that sticks. Because after they reach that goal, if they ever reach it, they're done. Because all they were focusing on was that weight loss goal. And it's really been proven to be one of the worst motivators when it comes to physical fitness. But the people that I see that are like, yeah, um, I want to be able to do this backpacking trip that I've always wanted to do. It's 20 miles from this mountain range to this mountain range, and I just want to see it, and I got to get ready. And, or they say, well, I got grandkids. I want to be able to keep up with them or, or, you know, those kinds of things. That's what makes people stick with a physical fitness routine and, and make exercise a priority in their life. It's, it's usually not those other conversations over there, although they're good. They're good. I mean, if you're going to have a heart attack, you probably, probably should work on that. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is just start, just to start you guys out, start thinking about it just in terms of your attitude. Um, and, and one other way that we here this week have a, to help you get started is we have some passes if you want to try. You know, we live in Helena, so it's hard. Or even just in this part of the country, you're inside, you know, like three months out of the year at least. So if you're interested in trying a gym, we have passes to Fuel or to Crossroads down there that you can take. And if they run out of the Crossroads ones, just find me after class uh, or after <laughs> after this talk. <laughs> I say that a couple times a week. Um, so anyway, and then lastly, I just wanted to share, one of, one of the things that motivates me the most in working at gyms is the people. I love the people that go to the gym. They just inspire me all the time. I had this one group of women in Billings at the Billings YMCA, and I started teaching morning classes there, which I'm not, <clears throat> my preference isn't for morning classes, but I'll do it. And so I started teaching morning classes there, and I kind of stumbled upon this group of women who were, I don't know, anywhere from 30 to 70. Like, they were just this broad age range, lots of different backgrounds, and they exercised every morning at the YMCA. And they didn't necessarily exercise together, you know. They weren't necessarily all in a treadmill together or in a class. But every morning, they were there at the Y, encouraging each other, lifting each other up. And I watched them go through a cancer diagnosis together, a loss of a spouse, and they would gather around and pray over each other. They would celebrate each other's birthdays every month. It was just the neatest community and neatest fellowship. And I just thought, how inspiring, you know, that they just take anyone who walked in that locker room door and they took them under their wing. And um, I was, got to be fortunate enough to get to know them while I was there. But, you know, find what you like. Figure out how to build it into your life. And... Um, so I wanted, I wish I could bring all of those people here to inspire you guys, like they inspire me, but I don't have all of them with me today, but I just, I did bring a couple that I want you to hear from. So tell us about how long you've been committed to exercising every day, kind of what your exercise commitment is. Every day. And how long? Every day, probably about 15 years. And what made you decide to do that, make that commitment? Getting old. <laughs> gotta move. It makes everything work. The exercise makes everything work. The only thing I don't exercise, I don't exercise my head enough. <laughs> and everybody should do that too. So you told me one time uh, something about when you come through the door in the morning. What do you always tell yourself? Oh, uh, I always claim that you always feel better when you leave than when you come. And no matter who you are. If you come to the club, you feel better when you leave than when you come. After 15 years, you still believe it? I've been here 26 years. So, do you mind telling us how old you are, Lee? 81, 1930, I was born in Helen, Montana, October the 4th. <laughs> how long have you been exercising as a big part of your life? As a big part of my life, probably the last 15 years. Uh, I did, when my daughter was growing up, I ran with her and some stuff, but okay. just lately. So what kind of stuff do you do? I um, run, I play golf, I ride bicycles, I walk, 
I garden. And why did you choose to make that a big commitment? Because I like it. I like coming to the club, um, all the young people that are here, and, and everybody's here. It makes you feel good. And when I run, I run a half marathon. It feels really, really good. I'm really proud I can do that. So this is great. How does it help your mental health? What would you say? Uh, I think I'm happier. And I think it's um, the physical fitness lends, lends to you being uh, sharper. I can do my puzzles and things like that better when I'm physically fit. It really adds to that. How long have you been exercising? How long has it been a priority in your life? Probably um, 10 years. 10 years, and what made it become a priority? Well, it, I have an ankylos and spondylitis, which is a type of arthritis, and if I, if I don't exercise, I it just get all just stove up. And, and so I've got to exercise. How do you notice that affects, makes your life better? Well, my life, my, I can breathe without hurting. Uh, that's the main thing. Um, and I can try to keep my he hip from getting even worse. So. And what about your attitude? Does it help your energy? And your oh, attitude? absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So Every day is a good day. <laughs> All right, let me pray with you guys. Lord, we just thank you for our health. We know that um, we are fortunate people to be in good health and for bodies that are just incredible the way you, in, in, the way you created us. It's, it's really amazing. And we just pray for inspiration to make some changes if that's what we need to do or to stay the course if that's where we're at. And we just thank you for your creation and uh, all that you're doing. Amen. Uh, that was a home run. <clears throat> Though I do feel like I need to stand up for the runners. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> Where are you, Don? Yeah, exactly. It's not boring. <laughs> anyway, uh, I guess a couple closing comments. Long before Narrate existed on Sundays, long before we existed as a community, there were many of us, as we dreamt about this, we dreamt about being the type of community that would uh, embrace experts in their field and just say, like, help us understand how that connects us to Jesus even better. And I think that's what Lindsay did, so way to go. Um, I'm, I was listening to a podcast the other week where they were talking about how Christian, Christians hate science, and it was actually a study on 30-somethings today and how one of their turnoffs to Christ is their disregard for science, and I was proud in my head going, like, well, that, that's not us, so... Thanks, Lindsay, for helping us with that and understand that we have bodies, which God talks a lot about, and that oftentimes Christianity attempts to separate physical health and spiritual health, and I don't know that that can be done. So way to go. Uh, stand up for the runners. Should love you guys. Have a great week. <laughs>